For the past several episodes of Top Gun Month here on the Fighter Pilot Podcast, you've heard both me and my guests repeatedly say the 1986 Top Gun and this year's sequel Top Gun Maverick are movies, not documentaries. Well, it's been a fun ride, but to round out Top Gun Month, this week we borrow a page from our sibling show, the F-14 TomCast, to discuss Speed and Angels, the real-life naval aviation story that is a documentary. We all love and hate Top Gun in our business, right? It's like it makes us familiar to the world, but it's also so unrealistic in 95% of the way it portrays us. So I had wanted to tell our story in a more realistic and still dramatic way. Every person who is a fighter pilot now dreamed of being a fighter pilot when they were a kid. You know, when you're young, you're like, I want to be a doctor, I want to do this, and I was like, I want to be a fighter pilot. All this training will finally become real to them, and they are on the front lines. Strap in for the Fighter Pilot Podcast, the internet radio show that explores the fascinating world of air combat, the aircraft, the weapon systems, and most importantly, the people. Now, here's your host, retired U.S. Navy fighter pilot, Vincent Aiello. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the show. I am your host, Vincent Aiello, call sign Jello, and this is episode 146. We are calling it Speed and Angels, the Naval Aviation Documentary, Not Movie, and I think you're really going to enjoy it. Now, for you F-14 TomCast listeners, you've heard this on episode 20, but for those of you who maybe just found the Fighter Pilot Podcast through Top Gun Month and all the shows we did around the Top Gun Maverick release, well, we want to introduce you to our sibling podcast, and you can find the F-14 TomCast wherever podcasts are available. Now, speaking of them, they are just about done. The plan all along was to do just a year of episodes every 14 days, every TomCat Tuesday, every other Tuesday. So they finish up at the end of August and they've got one more fundraiser coming up. So if you listen to episode 21, then you heard about that. You can go over to the Fighter Pilot Podcast shop page. There is a donate or help support the show area there. And on that PayPal, if you put in the notes at 14 Tomcast, then I think Crunch and Bio and Friends will send you something if you donate over a certain amount. I think it's a signed picture. So take a look at that and help keep the F-14 Tomcast in the black until we get to the end. Let's see what else is going on. I want to thank all my Patreon supporters who phoned in their enthusiastic messages for the beginning and at least in one case, the end of episode 145 last week. We had some various folks that did that, including my stepdad. He was one of those voices. But otherwise, I thought episode 145 was really great. All the feedback has been positive, and Ferg is just the man. I mean, I felt outclassed, frankly. He was really uh, holding court with me there, and I was just chuckling the whole time. I was a little self-conscious about that, honestly. But he really was in some important meetings and uh, discussions there and the coordination for Top Gun Maverick. And it was just great having him on. He's a busy dude, so I really enjoyed that. We kind of stumbled leading into it. He was supposed to be able to provide me some photos that we would promote on Instagram to build up for it. And we just didn't get the permissions in time. And that was partly my fault. Plus I had to make my graphic designer and artist Yannick uh, redo the episode artwork because the pictures he had ready just weren't released a bowl from uh, Paramount and the Navy, I guess. So anyway, all that being said, I thought episode 145 was great and sounds like you did too. Now, for you Digital Combat Simulator players, you probably know that the latest Raven 1 Dominant Fury campaign is out. It was with Baltic Dragon and Kevin Miller, Hoser, and the three of us worked on that. And it's a prequel to our previous Raven 1 campaign, and it should be available for sale now. And there is an Air Combat Sim episode that explains what we went through to build that. So check it out if you're so inclined. And then just a quick personal note here in the Aiello household, our middle son, Anthony, graduated high school this past week. Congratulations, Anthony. And that just happened to be on the first anniversary of my brother's passing. So we had some good times and some sad times all in one there. But for you longtime listeners, you might remember from last summer, my brother Rocky passed away. And then we commemorated him on the uh, Tiger Cruise episode. They had uh, at his old work there, KTM, they had a ride for Rocky Saturday. I'd gotten a road bike several months ago and started putting some miles on. And I went up there and did 40 miles, which was a new personal best for me. And we all uh, had a good time, celebrated my brother and his family seems to be doing okay. So anyway, uh, that's what's going on here. All right. I've got a few more listener questions that are affiliated with the Top Gun stuff. And then again, as I said before, those of you waiting patiently for your question to be answered, we should get to that hopefully in mid-July. 
The first is an email from Jay Roten, who says, I thoroughly enjoyed Top Gun Maverick, and thanks to your podcast, I was able to drop some knowledge when the questions started flying after the movie. That one I couldn't answer adequately was why were a pair of aircraft needed to attack the target? Is it doctrine to sortie two planes, or was it the shooter, the one with the LGBs, was heavy enough that the second aircraft had to carry the designator equipment? Well, to that second point, Jay, it's not a problem. The AT FLIR, as it's called, I think it only weighs four or 500 pounds. It's not that much. So that is not normally a limiting factor. In fact, if you saw when Hangman came out and saved the day at the end and then rolled away to go back to the ship, he was carrying two of those giant LGBs, a bunch of missiles. And I remember correctly, I think he also had an AT flare on there. He would have been too heavy, by the way, to recover right away on the ship. At any rate, no, it wasn't a question of weight, Jay. It's a function of, at least in everything prior to fifth generation, The basic fighting element was always a section or two ship, as the Air Force would call it. So you always want to have a wingman. You don't want to be running around as a raging single over enemy territory because you just always want to have a partner there to help you out. So, yeah, I think that was just the series there was they needed folks in secession, right? The consecutive miracles. And we don't want to send singles over enemy territory. So we'll have a section up front, a section in the back. And that seemed to make the most sense. And then, yeah, for the storyline, as we talked about with Grand on our fighter pilot, Top Gun Instructors React video on May 27th, that it's not uncommon to have a single in a two seat so that you can divide the tasks with a Wizzo like Bob in the movie. All right. Next is an email from Todd. He's from Australia. He says, are there special considerations for wet weather operations on the carrier flight deck? How do pilots and crews deal with open canopies and exposed cockpits during inclement weather? Do pilots get into cockpits prior to being exposed to wet weather or are aircraft cockpit somewhat waterproof cockpits, I guess. So Todd, good question. I don't know the exact engineering that goes into the cockpits, but I've gotten in some that have been very wet. And so I know that the boxes they put in there do have some degree of water resistance, but I don't think you'd want to submerge them. But typically what we do, is, if it's raining, you'll try to wear something over you that will protect you from getting soaked to the core and they'll leave the canopy down and then they'll just raise it when they need to. So if the plane captain needs to do something, they'll raise the canopy and a little bit of water intrusion is not unexpected, but then he or she might lower the canopy again while you're doing your pre-flight, let's say. And then when it's time to get in, and I've done this actually, you put someone on the canopy actuator switch and you get on the ladder and you say, ready, go. And they raise it, you jump up there. And especially if it's downpouring, you jump in, then you give them a thumbs up, you keep your hands clear, and then they lower it for you. And you try not to let too much water in. But that's a good question. I haven't done a whole lot of flying in the snow, but I assume it's fairly similar. And then, yeah, if you have ice, then you have other problems. Generally, that's not a problem in the cockpit, but you might need to get your aircraft de-iced. So, yep, inclement weather is an issue, and it never caused any kind of fallouts or crap outs uh, as far as the uh, jet going down. It's got some degree of tolerance there in the cockpit for some water. All right, next, let's take a phone call. Hey, Jello, this is Wes from St. Augustine, Florida. Uh, I saw one of the people asked about Afterburner on takeoff during the Top Gun Maverick movie. A little bit of uh, extra information. When the F-414 engine was in development and you went into Afterburner in the JBDs, it would re-ingest hot gases and it would freak out the control system and quite often you would get a stall. So then they came up with the AB limb. I'm sure you're familiar with this AB limb switch where if you deselected that or selected that, you could take off in afterburner. Otherwise, if you selected afterburner, when you got about 80 miles an hour wheel speed, there were some other parameters, then the control system would let you go into afterburner. Hope this has helped. And I love the podcast. Been a supporter for years. Take care. Thank you for that. So yes, this was in relation to a previous episode where we talked about selecting afterburner on the catapult. And if I understand what you're saying, there is a limit. I don't remember it being an actual physical switch, but whether it was part of the FADEC or just the flight control logic, or maybe not flight control, but something else like that, that there was some sort of limitation that it was not actually full afterburner, even though the pilot selected full afterburner while you were at zero knots with your launch bar down, because I guess the jet just assumed, okay, that's intention. And then once you then started moving, then it allowed full afterburner. But I don't recall that being something I had to do as the pilot. It's been over a dozen years since I've been on the ship. 
I don't remember that that was necessarily tied to AB limb, which was one of the FADEC issues you could have, which means there was just not full afterburner. But that was a degradation mode. That wasn't like something that was supposed to happen like it was on the catapult. I appreciate the call. I hope I'm understanding correctly what you're saying. All right, the last one is a bit of a longer email from Call Sign Fish. He says, on a recent episode, you mentioned getting a bit teary-eyed watching Top Gun Maverick. You're not the only person I've heard say this, and I myself was worried about shedding a tear or two during the movie. So much so that I was concerned about seeing the movie for the first time with my young son. What would he think about his dad turning into a blubbering idiot during the movie? You see, I was a naval flight officer who flew S-3Bs in a prior life, and like thousands of others, was heavily influenced by the original Top Gun to join the Navy and fly. And yes, I shed a few tears during the movie, but did a good job of hiding it. It didn't help that I saw it on Memorial Day weekend and was already thinking of friends and colleagues no longer with us. Now for my question. Why are grown men weeping over this movie? I can't explain why I got emotional during the opening flight scene or the beach football scene or the credits. Is there something wrong with me? Is it because being in the Navy and part of a squadron life was a big part of who I am and now there's that gaping hole in my life? I don't have the emotional intelligence to figure this out on my own, and I'm sure many others are in the same boat. So I'm asking for the Fighter Pilot Podcast's help to guide all of us on this emotional journey to figure out why grown men all over the country are cutting onions while watching this movie. Well, thank you, Fish. That is a great question. It's pretty deep. And look, I'm no shrink. I was a math major in college and then a fighter pilot. And now I have a podcast. So I'll give you my opinion because you're asking me. Now, first off, I don't think it's a big deal to let your son see you cry. I think it's part of being a man. I mean, okay, yeah, man stereotypes have changed over the years, right? Nothing used to bother men in the past. You were stoic about everything. I don't mind showing it. I think it's part of being human. And I think it's part of being a man that we can have a strong side and an emotional side. And I think that's true, by the way, for all humans, not just men. Secondly, I had to Google weep to make sure that I understood the right word. I mean, I know what weep means, but I didn't know if it meant, like you said, their fish, a bawling like a blubbering idiot or just crying. It sounds like it's just tears. So yeah, okay, weeping works. It's not what I would call it though. I think I would say I shed a tear because I think I was just proud. And I'm not talking about the kind of pride that some folks celebrate during the month of June. I mean, I just was proud to be part of something big and patriotic and glorious and noble. And when you do that, I think it becomes a part of you. I mean, shoot, that's why I have this podcast. It's like you said in your own email there, Fish, it's kind of who we are. And there is this gaping hole when you're done with it. And so we have this movie that just reminds us of how grandiose that is. And that we have this emotional investment in these characters, you know, with Maverick and Iceman see each other again, right? We've all been waiting 36 years for this moment and they're older. And of course, Val Kilmer has these real world health issues that they worked around in the story and I thought did a good job of. And so I think there's this redemptive part of it. There's the closure, there's the brotherly bond, and we've experienced that in our own real lives. And I just think it's normal. I think it's okay to feel a little tender about that. I did. Every movie. All three times I saw it, I got a little bit reclaimed is the word I would use, not quite weep. As I've said before, though, I think somewhere on the show, I forget, but I've been just a big emotional idiot since losing my brother a year ago anyway. So I, I can almost cry in a 30 second commercial if it's something about father and son or brothers or something else. So my nerves are all raw anyway and have been. And Many of you, by the way, have been kind to say, yeah, you may never get over that. You get better, but you don't get over it. And so I guess that's just how life's going to go. But yeah, I don't know, Fish. I think it was a great movie. There was a post on Facebook. Maybe some of you have seen it. Some guy, I don't know who it was, but other people shared it. And the guy basically said, what we loved about Top Gun Maverick is it was just good entertainment. It wasn't a message in your face. It wasn't the the one line I really loved that he wrote. It wasn't kids saving the world while hapless parents stood by. I did love that one. There was diversity, but it wasn't in your face. There was gender differences and, you know, Hangman was a little bit mean about it, but Phoenix held her own. It was just entertainment and we enjoyed it. And so maybe just to take a break from everything else, Fish, and just enjoy a movie and feel proud about something was enough. And it certainly was for me. All right, well, that will do it for listener questions. Let's get on to the interview. Now, again, as I said at the top, you TomCast listeners will recognize this from episode 20. If I didn't say it before, again, we were looking for some way to wrap up Top Gun Month. 
We thought this was a good way to do it. It features Crunch from episode 94. It features Bio. He is the other F-14 Tomcast co-host. He's not been on a numbered FPP episode, but we had him on for one of his books we were promoting. And then one of the guests, Paco, was our episode 43 guest discussing the F-5. But Megan has not been on our show before. So enjoy this replay, please, of Speed and Angels from our friends at the F-14 Tomcast. And I'll catch you on the flip side. Here we go. Hi, I'm Dave Baronic, call sign bio. I was an F-14 Rio and Top Gun instructor, and I'm one of your hosts for the F-14 Tomcast. Now, the Tomcat has starred in several full-length movies, and today we're talking about the only one that was a true story, Speed and Angels. Released in 2008, Speed and Angels is a documentary about two fighter pilots going through F-14 training near the end of the Tomcat's U.S. Navy service. And I'm Craig Snyder, call sign Crunch, and I was an F-14 pilot and Top Gun instructor as well, and I'm your other host here on the F-14 Tomcast. Now, our guests today are both former Tomcat pilots. Paco Chirichi, he was the driving force behind the movie Speed and Angels, and Megan Vargas Flanagan was one of the stars billed as Megan Varley. All right, so Paco and Vargas, both of you, welcome to the F-14 Tomcast. Happy to be here. Thanks for having us. Well, great. We'll tell you what, let's start off with, we always like to set a little baseline so our audience knows where you guys are from, what's going on. Megan, let's start with you. Where are you from? How'd you get commissioned? And how'd you get into naval aviation? Most importantly, how'd you get into the F-14? Oh, yeah. I'm originally from Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. I now call Whitefish, Montana hometown. I love Pittsburgh, but Whitefish, it's the best town in the world. But grew up in Pittsburgh and had no desire to be in the military or fly or anything. And then I saw, you know, some people heard of it, a movie called Top Gun, about 10 years old, pretended to be sleeping, stayed up, got to see all the scenes, if you know what I mean. (laughs) And while I liked them all, the dogfighting scenes were the ones that I just was like, ooh, I don't know what's going on here, but I like this. And I declared to my parents the next morning that I was going to be a fighter pilot. And then, you know, at the time, women were not allowed to fly fighters, didn't know it. Luckily, my parents, they said, you could go to this place called Naval Academy. And when you graduate, you can be a fighter pilot. So I said, I'm going to go do that. A little bit more path in there in the middle, but went to Naval Academy, graduated, went on to flight school. I had very lucky timing and I snagged one of the last four Tomcat spots before they sun down the pipeline. So went through uh, training in the Tomcat final combat deployment in a big fighter. Super, super lucky. That's yeah. awesome. So where'd you go to school? Naval Academy. You went to the Naval Academy? Can you? Yield? I think I knew that. What class were you? 2002. I was an aerospace astronautical track major. Sat next to smart kids. Gotcha. What class were you, Crunch? I was 93. All right. Respectable difference there. (laughs) I got like some salt and pepper on the side there to show my age. Uh, Paco, how about you? Maya and I are not going to tell what year we graduated. Yeah. I was uh, ROTC at Boston University. That's the way to go, by the way, because you can still be a college student and not a prisoner. I had no military or aviation experience in my family, so I really needed the money for school. And the scholarship obviously helped that. And then the summer between my sophomore and junior year, I got a backseat ride in F-14 out in Miramar on a Wednesday. Wow. Wait a minute. How did you get that? Was it on a midshipman cruise, you mean, training? or? Yeah, it was the summer. It was Courtship Mid. I don't know if they still call it that. or. Yeah, yeah, we did that. Okay, yeah. sorry. So, you know, some guys got S3s, some guys got T-34s, you know, whatever. I, like Megan said, I mean, luck is everything. I got a backseat ride in F-14 at Miramar on a Wednesday. And Wednesday means something, it, certainly back then. So, you know, I got to go up with, and it's a really good story, but it was the guy who ended up being, I found out a year later, the lead coordinator with the F-14 in uh, the movie Top Gun. His name is Lloyd Bozo Abel. He never said anything about the movie. It was his first flight back in a month. We went out, did some very uh, light acro, and then a, a nugget joined up and we did some really light BFM. And then we came back and, you know, I had a flight suit with no patches on it. The nugget gave me his jacket. We went to the club and I was just like, this is the greatest day of my life. <laughs> and then I graduated school, went to flight school, and I got selected for A6s, which is great. I mean, it was my second choice, but I enjoyed my tour in A6s. And then my squadron got decommissioned, and I focused myself to the greatest extent possible to get myself a transition. I think my package for the transition was like over 100 pages long. Endorsements from CAG and other squadron CEOs and stuff like that. I got picked up, obviously, for the transition, went through the RAG on the East Coast, but I was up in 213 for my uh, squatter tour. It was awesome. So you went from A6 to the Tomcats and you said you were in 213. Is that right? What year are we talking about now? 93 to 96. 
93 to 96. Okay. What happened after that? I think you got on the Navy about that, right? Yeah. I was going to have to go do a year of uh, shore duty and then back out to sea because I did back-to-back sea tours. So for a variety of reasons, I chose to leave the active duty and jump into the reserves. So I flew F5s for another 10 years as an adversary, which turned out to be the best thing ever. It was amazing. That's amazing flying right there. That's awesome. Yeah, it was great. And Megan, how about you? Which squadrons were you in? I was in 213 with you, Crunch. Yes, ma'am. My department was very intimidating. 213 for about three and a half years. Excellent timing. Combat deployment in the Tomcat. Came home. Transitioned to the latest block, Super Hornet, dual joint helmet, all the Gucci stuff. Flew that for about two years. Went and did an aid tour for two years out of Norfolk. Shockingly, one of the best tours I had. My boss, real and Mark Benzel, call sign Benz. He was an S3 guy. One of the best officers I ever had the privilege of working with. So just actually had a really good aid tour, which is not normal. No, very nice. That's great to hear. Yeah, yeah. it was awesome. He was like, he was a facilities guy. So the op tempo wasn't bad and he was just spectacular. And then I went and became a rag instructor after that at 106. And I was a rag instructor in the Super Hornet and the Hornet. Had a baby at the end of that tour, had screened for department head. Said, you let me do anything else because I want to have some more kids? And they said, nope. And I said, see ya. <laughs> so I went to the reserves. And didn't want to go flying reserves because I was going to be working a more traditional job, so I wouldn't be able to fly regularly. And the time away from the cockpit when I was pregnant, I knew proficiency was something I thought was fairly important. But I'm still in the reserves now. Uh, I just hit 20, uh, Commander, and I still enjoy that time. So I'll be staying in for at least the immediate future. Hey, congratulations. Thanks. Yeah, very nice. You know what? That's a hard saying. Proficiency is very important. That's like, right. okay, you know, that's yeah. a truism. I was like, I don't want to be flying these things like once a month, you know, with rag students. I just, <laughs> that doesn't seem like the answer. I don't want to do a bull face every time I fly. Oh, yeah. I'll tell you what, man. I just started flying F5s again with TAC Air. Holy Moses. I hadn't flown F5s in 14 years, I think. And whoa, whoa, whoa. How old are you? 14 years? <laughs> I'm 56. And you're not as young as you think you are. <laughs> you're just younger. Forever. Before we get too far away, I mean, you guys both have incredible, interesting careers and great flying careers. And But Paco, you had the A6 time. How many A6 hours did you have? And when you switched to Tomcats, did that help you? Like, especially, you know, was it a Grumman airplane, you know, the fuel system or what? Talk about that a little bit. So I had a full tour in A6s. I did a full workups, cruise workups, and I had about 800 hours or so in the A6. And yes, it helped a huge amount going over the Tomcat. I mean, like you said, the systems are were almost identical. All the buttons look the same. You know, obviously the plane is dramatically different, but the guts of it were very similar. And the other thing that really helped was that all of my instructors were guys I went through the training command with or I was on deployment with. So it was very collegial. I had a great time. Like the year I was in the F-14 ride was probably one of the, the most fun years I had in the Navy. I was finally flying the plane that I always wanted to fly. And it was with you know my buddies and it was perfect. I made this point when I've talked about this before, because when I went back through the rag, you know, especially after being a Top Gun instructor and you see all the rag instructors, a few of them came through Top Gun and stuff. So it is collegial, Mm -hmm. but it's not like they cut you slack. I mean, I think that's an important point to make for the audience, especially like on your NATOPS test, you got to have, you know, 100% verbatim and in simulators. So it's kind of fun working with people that you really know. And yeah, there's a lot of hidden stressors in there, which maybe are not obvious to your point. I didn't want to embarrass myself, right? I was the guy that had 800 fleet hours and 200 traps. I didn't want to embarrass myself with the Nuggets and with my instructor peers. It made me work on different things a lot harder than perhaps I would have before, but it also just eliminated so much of the stress about whether or not I could do this. I kind of knew I could do the big picture stuff. I didn't want to embarrass myself on the little stuff. So That's cool. So Crunch, did we have anything else to talk to these guys about? Or is that, is that basically it? <laughs> nice interview. Thanks for coming. Okay, thanks, everybody. Have a good weekend. Well, hey, let's get to the movie first. Paco, tell us a little bit about the backstory. So the backstory of the movie is, it could be an incredibly long story, but the synopsis of it is, I had wanted to tell the story of naval aviation from our point of view, from the naval aviators' point of view. We all love and hate Top Gun in our business, right? It's like it makes us familiar to the world, but it's also so unrealistic in 95% of the way it portrays us. So I had wanted to tell our story in a more realistic and still dramatic way. And I had written a screenplay, which was horrible. I read it a little while ago and it was just pathetic, but I really was determined to do this. One day I walked into a 
a surfing documentary with a good buddy of mine. And I don't surf, but this documentary blew me away. Just the way it pulled you into the story of surfing and the community of surfers and the visual storytelling. And I literally, I walked out of that documentary. I was on the sidewalk and I called Peyton Wilson, who Megan knows very well, who was a very good friend of mine at the time, who is a, a director. And I said, Peyton, I got a proposition for you. Let's make a movie about fighter pilots, a documentary. And, you know, that was the genesis of the film. The genesis was I wanted to tell a great story about naval aviation, and it turned out to be a documentary. I got to commend you for one, for having that giant vision like that, and two, for following through. It reminds me of when I was a JO on my very first deployment before you guys were even born, certainly before Megan was born. <laughs> and we were sitting there in uh, Mid Rats on that carrier, Mid Rats was breakfast one of the squadrons was sitting there writing things down. And somebody goes, what are you writing? He goes, I'm making notes. He goes, this is a great environment. I'm writing down what people say and characteristics and stuff. And I'm not going to say the guy's name, but I don't, he never did anything with it, yeah. you know, but shows that a lot of guys in naval aviation, especially in the Tomcat community realize yeah. this is just cool. I always had this perspective when I was in the Navy, more active duty than in the reserves, but like, I felt like this was such an incredibly unique and exciting world. And I always felt very privileged to be a part of it. I was very conscious of that. And I always knew that eventually I'd try to tell a good story about it. Like we said earlier, nothing embarrassing or critical. Just by its very nature, this drama is incredible. I never took notes, but I kept a lot of it up here. <laughs> what about funding? I mean, it had to have cost you a lot of money. How'd you do that? So I raised a bunch of money from friends and family to get what's called the sizzle reel. And the sizzle reel is actually great. It's on YouTube. It's called The Last of the Dogfighters. And you can check it out. It's super fun. It's really... Uh, originally, when we started the documentary, we thought it was going to be just about VFC-13 in Fallon, who was at the time the last real adversary squadron in the Navy. Sorry, Omar's. Real. So the sizzle reel, it's, yeah, <laughs> it's a 12-minute long concept. You know, I raised a bunch of money from folks... And we use that to both entice the Navy to let us tell a story because we're independent production and there's more on that later. And then also to raise money from people. And eventually I had to go out to individual investors. I found this one guy, Mike Homer, who ended up being our executive producer and unfortunately passed away right when the movie was over. But he was our angel. He understood what we were trying to do. He had this great vision about marketing and distribution and sales. You know, he helped raise the rest of the money and it was a big budget. It was a million and a half dollars, which is a massive budget for a documentary. If you've seen the movie, you know that it you know, went to paying for jet fuel. We spent it, most of that on gas. Okay. So did you have to uh, pay the Navy back for the fuel that was used to film or did you guys leverage scheduled training flights? Both. Okay. Our deal with the Navy was anytime there was a regularly scheduled flight, we could throw some cameras in and there's a ton of that in the movie. When we would dedicate some assets. We did this over the course of uh, two separate shoots in Fallon, essentially. We would have to pay, you know, there's a, literally an hourly rate that the government puts out for all its assets for film companies. The Tomcat, I'll never forget this, was something like $14,500 per hour. You know, and the F5 was $3,000 per hour. That was the film rate to rent these planes. And man, it was, I tell you, stressful. Like you take off and you're waiting for people to rejoin to set up a shoot. And you're like, oh my God, that just cost me you know, $7,000. <laughs> Holy crap, there goes our budget. Yeah. It was pretty intense dealing with that financial aspect aside from the permissions from the military, from the Navy. Now, how about the uh, approval process? You talked about basically like a teaser film to get the Navy involved. Obviously you had to go through Chinfo or something like that. Who ultimately decided and was there any like really stress points of just getting to yes? Yeah. Yeah. It was incredibly stressful. So it turns out there's two different departments in Chinfo that deal with approvals for documentaries and film and stuff like that. One of them's in DC and they do all the non-scripted. And then the other one's in LA and they handle all the scripted stuff. Our filming dealt with both, right? So I just discussed that, you know, anytime we threw a camera in a plane that was scheduled, that was free, but a big part of the movie was recreating all these great dogfights and other stuff that was going on. We wanted the visuals to really be eye-popping, to be as good or better than Top Gun. I had to deal with both of these 
departments. And the one in DC was like, absolutely, this is great. We love you guys. This is awesome. So within a month, we had permission to do all the documentary stuff. So the F-14 went away in, uh, what was it, September 2006, I think was the last flight. The last Fallon debt was in June of 2006. There's a wall right here where I would bang my head against the wall <laughs> every day for eight hours a day, calling people to say, hey, I'm doing this documentary. Can we uh, use your assets? No. Well, can I talk to your boss? Sure. And I did that literally for two and a half years. And I finally was able to talk to the air boss down in San Diego. I went in and talked to him for 10 minutes. I had kneeboard cards with all the maneuvers that we were going to be filming, everything down to the knots, incredible detail. And he just looked at our sizzle reel. He listened to me talk for about five minutes. I showed him the kneeboard packet and he's like, this is great. Two thumbs up. And I literally like the stress just like flushed out of me. I, it was unclear whether we were going to be able to get this footage. And we had promised all our investors all this footage. So there was a tremendous amount of stress. Who was the air boss at that? Uh, I'm trying to remember. It was the guy before Dave Buss. Was it Admiral Zortman? It was Zortman, yeah. Gotcha. 2006. Was that Comnav Air Pack? Yes. Air Pack in 2006. Yeah. But yeah, anyway, like getting through his chief of staff was a nightmare. And he was, he was a good guy. He just didn't want to screw his <laughs> boss over, right? So he had a good chief of staff is what you're saying. No, I mean, he wanted to know everything. My brief to the chief of staff the day before meeting uh, the air boss was an hour and a half. Every kneeboard card, everything. He had a thousand questions, which is great. I was impressed that he wanted to protect the Navy and the assets and not waste anybody's time. It was super stressful. One of the biggest problems was there had never been an independent film approved by the Navy, right? So everything else ever approved by DOD and Navy has Paramount behind it or some other big production studio and distribution system. You know, we were just this plucky little independent film that was coming up with a couple of million and a half bucks that wanted to tell a good story. Yeah. They had no idea what to make of us. So the easiest answer is always no, right? Like, and you just have to fight your way through the nose. And that sucked. So Vargas, how'd you hear about the movie and how'd you get roped into it? Well, when I was in the RAG, it was so small at that point because the last classes were going through that there was a fighter debt to Key West and my class was in WCS. But because that was basically all the instructors going, the WCS class went down as well. And that's when the Saints were in Key West as the adversaries for the fighter debt. So Peyton was there and doing some video. and I was there too. Yeah. I do not want to be token girl. <laughs> like I'm... <laughs> stiff arming this thing like beyond all recognition it's funny because it's in the movie but the first time i talked to peyton she just happened to jump in the van that was taking us back to the queue after flight ops the boq and she just started asking me some questions yeah and you can tell i'm in a van she's asking me whatever but so i started talking to her and then she kind of said hey can you come in and let me just interview you for like an hour and i was like all right and what i really respected is peyton had been avoiding me because she didn't want to have a token female either so we had been unanimously yeah. like <laughs> staying away from each other. It's pretty funny. Yeah. Yeah. There was a lot of stereotypes that we were trying to avoid. We just wanted to tell a real true story. Mm -hmm. And it turns out that Megan, as you can tell, if you watch the movie was irresistible. <laughs> Flatter gets you everywhere with me. Paco. <laughs> I know. <laughs> I really still have a great friendship with Peyton and I just really trusted and enjoyed talking to her. And then she ended up coming back, you know, cause at that point they were there for the saints and Paco can correct me, but it was just because the saints were there that she was there. And then they sort of pivoted and they said, we think the real story here is with these green, like excited at the beginning of their career people. So we want to pivot to the students. And so she was following a handful of students and she said, you know, because I've asked her like, well, why me? Because we both didn't want the token woman. And she just said, you were really honest. You're really transparent. You weren't trying to act cool. You would just be like, I got my ass kicked, but it was really cool. Like, I don't know what happened. I think I downed the flight, but it was really, fun. you know, it was really fun. Whereas she just joked around that a bunch of the guys would be like, yeah, you know, I did this. And then I was, you know, just trying to come off a certain way. And I just, I didn't care. So I think she was just drawn to the fact that I'd give it to her straight. And then eventually two stories sort of filtered to the top of the film, which was Jay's stories and my story. Yeah, that is really cool. I mean, I had no idea that that's how it all evolved. It didn't really start out with that end in mind, but... I wasn't even on a plan, but I was like plan Sierra or something. You know what I mean? Like, it was just pivoted and eventually just came over to me. Yeah, I mean, like Megan said, the film started off being about the saints because that's where I was. And that was... A, we thought it was going to be such a cool story, like the Jedis of dogfighting in the desert, right? Right. And that is a cool story. I can yeah. see how that 
would appeal. Okay. Documentaries are a live animal and you follow what happens. And literally Peyton was watching, there's these things called dailies where, you know, you watch all the film that you took that day and you just kind of scroll through it and see what's popping. And she was like, man, you know, the saints are cool, but these students are phenomenal. They're electric. They're so excited. Maybe we should follow them more, make it an equal story about saints and them. And I'm like, uh, I don't know. The saints are so much cooler than these rag students. <laughs> <They're so lame. laughs> well, we could interview these young people or we could interview Buckethead. Yeah. And- <laughs> <laughs> yeah my kid is like the best narrator for that movie oh my god that voice gravelly voice of doom <laughs> but anyway i mean it quickly became obvious that one of the things you'd like to have in a story is what's called an arc you know beginning middle and end and the students have this very clearly definable arc they're young and excited they go through all these trials and tribulations and at the end of it they go to cq and they complete or don't complete their training and that's after that Key West debt, that's what we thought the movie was going to be about, just rag training. And then obviously that was just two thirds of the movie because these guys kept giving us so much more material, they just wouldn't quit. And so it was more, you know, that the first deployments became really integral to that third act of the film. Okay, so let's go back to uh, Megan again when the film started and when you emerge as, you know, one of the points of interest. Did you find that this was distracting to your rag training? or interrupted or anything? Or did you just kind of take it on and like, okay. No, I mean, I think we're so lucky because aside from when there'd be a small crew that would come out to set up the cameras and the jets, it was just Peyton. Like Peyton had a video or a camera. She didn't have anyone else with her. She did most of the filming by herself. Wow. So it was really low. You just wouldn't even know it. She would just be there. That woman's here again, you know, and she would just be like, Hey, let me pull you over here in this room where no one's at and ask you some questions or like, yeah. You know, sneakily have the camera there and it's on. And I don't even know it. Well, also, we were still following about a dozen, maybe not a dozen, but a number, seven pilots at the time. We didn't know what the story was going to be. Yeah. And we didn't know it was just going to be Jay and Megan. For a while, it was a half dozen of these guys who were all fairly interesting. I don't think it was a distraction, but I also think you've got a bunch of alpha personalities and no one's going to be like, come videotape me, but everybody wants to be the, the center of attention. Yeah. So when I showed up to the RAG, and I'll never forget it because I was at the Naval Academy where there were like 25% women and there's just a lot. It wasn't a thing. And then I was in flight school and there were women. And then I got to Kingsville and I was like, oh, there's nobody here but me because the last girl just left. And that's a little weird, but all the instructors totally treated me exactly like all the guys. So I still didn't really notice it. And then other women showed up. But then I got to the Tomcat rag. The very first person I met from the rag said, what are you doing here? They blacklisted women from flying this airplane. And I was like, Hello, nice to meet you too. And then all of a sudden there's people videotaping me. So I already had this like weird spotlight. So it wasn't like Peyton and Paco and the whole team were super undercover, like very respectful and not distracting, but it was just one more thing for some people I think to resent or like, (laughs) be like, why are they following the girl? You know, like that part of it. And I don't say that that was like high on a one to 10 spectrum, but that I would say was more of a thing. I would get comments from men who... I think wish that they were the ones being videotaped. You know what I mean? I'm like, I can't help you there. Like, I can't help with your ego problem. That is uh, fascinating. Just to add some background, my wife never watched the movie before, and I've been married to my wife for a long time, so she's been through you know three fighter squadrons and everything else. But she watched it with me just the other day. She thought you were just another fighter pilot, basically, which is good. Yeah, you know that came across to me from watching it. That's what you wanted to be. So on that note, if I can interrupt, Bio, sorry. So I was rewatching this afternoon, and there was a note in there that somebody had said, hey, you were the only active F-14 pilot female type at the time or something like that. And all I had to hit pause. And I sat there and I went, I don't think that's right. And I started, like, ripping off names in my head. I'm like, well, okay, all right. Okay. And uh, in the end, I was like, well, I guess because they've all transitioned or they're yeah. in yeah. TPS or whatever. Cause I was like, what about Carrie Kuykendall? I'm like, no, she was in TPS. <laughs> and so yeah. and I was like, wow, which actually is a testament to the community because I was like, I don't think that's true. There was more of them. No, there weren't. <laughs> People have asked me for 20 years, like, oh, how many women flew Tomcats? And I'm like, I think I've counted seven. I think it's less than 10. I don't think there were that many. And but yeah, by the time I got there, there were what? I can't remember. When I came to the RAG, I think there were like eight or nine squadrons left. Mm-hmm. And I just remember like people come up to me at the O Club, we'd be drinking. 
And I was an ensign too. I got through flight school really fast. So that was abnormal as well. And they'd be like, we heard there was a female ensign pilot. Like what? <laughs> you know, it's like a unicorn. They're like, what is this thing over here? And I'm just hammered at the club. Like, what's And she's that? also a movie star. <laughs> <laughs> Well, Megan, I'll also say that I remember there was one time when I remember Peyton came on. We were at the ship. Yeah. She came on and set up to watch a brief or something like that. Yeah. I may have the details wrong. It may have been at the hangar, but I feel like it was at the ship. And I remember going, hey, what's going on? Oh, we're doing filming? Am I in frame? Because yeah. I don't want to be. <laughs> <laughs> and I remember a bunch of us going, all right, so uh, how do we make sure we're not in frame? Right. So Because we don't want to be on this movie, yeah. whatever it is. Yeah. No, I mean, I think that's an instinct. You never want to be yeah. in any... Well, again, there are people who are like, I don't want to be on that, but I do. Yeah. That's yeah, right. <laughs> I want to say I don't want to be on it. Yeah, it's like, no, 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 no. Yeah, yeah. Oh, please, please. Oh, I fell into frame. Here I am. Totally. <laughs> That was the thing that we had to overcome the most with the aviators. Just that sense of trust. Like, we're not going to embarrass you. We're not going to humiliate you. We're not going to make you look stupid. We're just trying to tell, like, the real story of who we are. Mostly, and I wish Peyton were here because she really needs her due. Like, she is the director extraordinaire for making this film come to life. She, like Megan said, would show up all by herself. She was her own sound person, which is very rare. She did all her own marking of the tapes and stuff like that, which she hates doing. You know, she's used to managing a hundred different people and having them all do everything other than the directing part. So huge, huge kudos to Peyton for not only showing up and doing all this work, but being able to gain the trust of a really suspicious, cynical bunch of naval aviators <laughs> and find that, you know, the honest core of the story, right? Because there's a lot of screens that we throw up, not just trying to avoid the camera, but if you're on camera, you know, the sort of the sports answers, you know, like I'm just looking to hit the ball and be a team player and, you know, make it to the next game or whatever. We've all talked to the press before and had those stock answers and to sort of break through that and be able to get that honest kernel that really is what makes the movie. You know, I watched some of the scenes at the O Club when guys were making spectacles of themselves and other guys, and I'm sitting there going, you know, I used to love going to the O Club. I mean, I went yeah. to the O Club a lot, especially when I was a J-O, and I yeah. love all the camaraderie and everything. But if somebody had showed up there with a camera, I'm sitting there going like, that would have just like skewed yeah. everything. And I'm so glad I wasn't involved in that. Well, you know, it's kind of funny because that O Club scene at that patching, I don't remember that getting filmed and I'm watching this. I'm like, hey, that's me. I was there. <laughs> <laughs> when did that happen? I don't remember. Yeah. yeah, it was just like a little thing. It was very unintrusive. Like, I think she's such a genuine person, right? Like mm. she really was connecting with people. And I remember when she came to me, because like, as far as my story arc went, we had a lot of footage and then I did well in the rag. I didn't have any issues in the rag with anything. And then when I got into workups about halfway through, I started having some real struggles with my landing grades and that perpetuated for the first few months of my deployment. And I remember getting home from deployment and she, just her ability to sit down and say, Hey, I really think we should talk about this in the film. And that's obviously... Is it hard to be like, let me put out like my biggest failure in life on a film that all these people are going to see? Yeah. Where right now, my story arc's like, badass chick, getting stuff done. You know what I mean? Megan, I just got goosebumps because literally like, that is the coolest part of the film because we're all naval aviators. We've all seen this. There are people who lose, you know, like I hate to quote Top Gun the movie, but they lose the edge, right? There's yeah. people, we all know people that DQ'd or that were on a downward spiral and they had to get kicked out. And I don't know many people who went down and literally pulled themselves up by their own bootstraps. Like that to me is one of the most inspirational movies or moments in the movie. And I know I tell you this, I tell you it all the time. Whenever I have some sort of frustration in my life, I'm like, I oh, if Megan could do it, I could do it. You know? <laughs> I'm not lying. Well, I appreciate that. You know, as you're watching it, you could look at it as, oh, wow, here's a story about how a failure, almost failure. In reality, it's a story of success because you're yeah. like, yeah, but what happens next? Yeah. Right. And it's absolutely amazing because yeah. there's a lot of people who go through that. And that's a story that's not told very often. No. That mental aspect, when you lose, sorry, I'll, I'll let you, we've seen it. I was an LSO. I dealt with these issues all the time and I never really saw anybody recover from it except me. And she did it by herself. That's awesome. Yeah. But point being, that's because Peyton was really good at her job. And she's a, just a phenomenal person, a phenomenal director. She made people feel comfortable. And she made me feel comfortable enough to say, you're right. This can be cathartic for me. 
this can also be something that helps other people who are in a bad place, like come out of it. And I felt safe and secure that I could have these interviews with her. And if I was like, dude, that came off, not the way I wanted to come off. I want to refilm that. Or like, please don't use that. I felt complete trust that she was going to be respectful of what I needed to be comfortable, which I wouldn't have done it if that wasn't the case. So I think if another director had attempted to do it, might not have gotten the same story. Well, in terms of this interview, if you ask us not to use something, you can trust us. Unless it's really <laughs> funny, then we're going to use it anyway. So, Well, I will say that we had the same sort of caveat with our film folks. We're like, anything you want out. But there was a couple things where we sort of twisted the arm a little bit. Like, oh, this is good. Just just trust us. You'll come up okay. <laughs> Crunch. <laughs> Crunch, you know, you said no. Keep that in. Scott, keep that in. That's right. So it's funny. You were talking about trust, you know, trust with naval aviators and a skeptical bunch. One of the things, as I was sitting here thinking about this, preparing for this discussion, I put on my, if I were CEO at the time, put that hat on, I would be very distrustful, Mm -hmm. right? Especially if I were the rag CEO, I would be very distrustful of any film crew. And not because I didn't trust you, but just because I'm like, look, we've got a mission here and you've got your little project and that's cute and all, but we've got a mission and it's very expensive and I can't afford to have Vargas derailed because there's a camera interface, right? I can't afford that. 100%. How did you get past that? Did you ever have that problem? The whole time. We filmed for, uh, I think, what, four years, Megan? Or- yeah, like three, yeah, three years. It was a long time. It was supposed to be 18 months and I think we went on for about four years. So we had multiple COs that we dealt with. I knew a few of them. You know, I didn't know all of them. I had, I think, a good enough reputation in the Navy that I was able to leverage that a little bit. And I had some champions like Buckethead. We make fun of Buckethead a little bit, but we love him. Oh, yeah. Great dude. Great guy. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Just an amazing guy. And he was a super big champion for me and Peyton and the film and the kids in it. And so we had a lot of people that were trusted in the business that put forth that we were doing something positive. We were on a mission to shine a light on how great naval aviation is and the Tomcat, as it turns out, but really naval aviation. And that's what our goal was. And to do it in an unvarnished and honest, but positive way. And so I think ultimately that won the day. I spent a a lot of time dealing with skippers and their nose. Crunch, when we were in 213, we were doing workups and we were doing like bombing missions in, what was it, Pine Castle? What was it in, you know what I mean, around Jacksonville? In Florida. I had a, like an early drop and the bomb went off the range. And I get back, but that happened to be one of the flights where we had a camera in the jet. And the first thing, like, I think it was Slayboy, like they were pissed and like, I'm getting grilled and like, well, you know, was this because there was a, a video camera in that jet? Yeah. Were you just trying to get the seat? And I was like, I didn't even realize it was there. I'm a nugget. I just fucked it up. I just made a mistake. I promise you, I, I would have wanted to look much cooler on video. Yeah. And to their credit, I mean, all the skippers had the right concerns in mind, right? And you said it, yeah. Crunch, like there's a mission here Everybody and everybody's lives are at risk, right? I mean, if you're, how many times have we uh, lost a Tomcat in a photo X, right? Ooh. A lot of times, right? Ooh, There's yes. Like VF31 where, hey, watch this. When they went up and they did the... Right. You should have seen some of the ones that went on before you guys joined the fleet. Right. But I'm saying there's a lot of... I mean, it's been going on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. We all knew. And there was a moment where we were filming the sizzle reel where somebody literally said, watch this on camera. We were like, knock it, it off, knock it scared off. the <laughs> crap out of me. I was in the back seat holding the camera, and I deleted that film. <laughs> yeah, well, that's, that's a good what, call. That's what they used to say. What are the two words a Rio hates to hear? Watch this. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> My Rio is hated to hear when I said, "Oh shit!" Especially off the cat at night. <laughs> Oh, shit. What? Oh, I just dropped my pen. <laughs> I just had like 17 scenes go through my head just now where I'm like, oh, those are all so funny. Bio, we need to have like an outtake where we just tell stories about yeah. things like this. We're going to start off with little feeder things oh, like, shit. all right, Paco said, oh, shit, what's on your mind? Yeah. <laughs> We're going to have like all these stories. <laughs> Either I dropped my pen or my red filter came off the ADI. <laughs> oh, shit. oh, my God. Uh, well, the red filter came off. That was... Pure crisis, especially if it fell on the floor. And you're like, oh, no, now what? <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> so for the audience, what that means is we were flying at night. The filter made the light go down to like 5% of normal, whatever. Yeah. And then if that thing came off, the pilot's blinded by this bright on light. A night cat shot at, you know, 60 feet. And you're like, oh, shit. <laughs> you're completely blinded. You can't see. And then you got to get it. And the darn filter's underneath the ejection seat. It's a little flat piece of plastic. So, And you're wearing gloves, probably. Yeah. 
That's right. It was like basically like a six inch by nine inch piece of colored plastic. And you try to pick this thing off the floor. You couldn't reach the floor because you're strapped in. The only way to do it was to unstrap yeah. from the parachute and reach down to pull this thing up, get it back in and then punch back in, which you're not doing at 500 feet. No. So you're just driving down like blind, you know, I, oh my God. Why didn't we tie strings to those filters? I mean, I had a string on my pen on my kneeboard all the time. I don't know. I don't know. There was that little Velcro strap. You like clip it in and there's like a little Velcro strap that you were supposed to put over. Yeah. But sometimes it would break. I think we didn't like flying at night so much that we just ignored it. <laughs> <laughs> well, it was too late by then. Yeah. Right? You'd be like, you'd be like, you'd be on the cat shot. Oh, it's really dark out. Oh, I dropped my filter. Yeah. Jets down. <laughs> <laughs> Launch the spare. Launch the spare. <laughs> and back when I was a J.O., Debo Dabowski would keep getting launched to the spare every time Crunch went down on a night cat shot so he hates you to this day <laughs> i remember thank you <laughs> that's funny Vargas, you were one of the last pilots to go through f-14 training and i think your comment about the rag shrinking down because the classes were going away i mean that's just hard for me to believe every time i went through the rag it was like you know a big machine cranking people out i mean at first there were 20 fleet squadrons and then later there were less than 20 but a lot of squadrons so think back to you're a nugget pilot in the rag. What for you was the hardest part about learning to fly the big fighter, the Tomcat? Was it ACM? And I don't mean the one you dread the most thinking about it, but I mean, was it carrier landing? Was it tanking? Was it, you know? I mean, truth be told, I did well in the rag. Like I didn't have one part in the rag where I struggled. My struggle started in the fleet, but I will say in the rag, the one that I guess that pops to my mind most is when we tanked. And that was the first time we tanked. <laughs> I remember we had to get six plugs, I think. And I got like six plugs out of eight tries or something. I was like, bam in, bam in, bam in. I was like, Woo yeah. And I remember getting I'm good down. at this. I'm good. I'm a natural. No problem. And we were taking off an S3 or something. I remember getting back and I think it was Hack Williams. who was one of our rag instructors, phenomenal pilot. But I remember he was like, he gave me so much shit in that debrief. You were coming in too quick. And, blah, blah, blah. and I'm like, why didn't you say something when we were up there? I'm not nailing it. You know, <laughs> he's like, if you do that on a big wing, you're going to rip your throat. Like, he was just like all over my ass in the debrief. And I remember like after that, that was like a memory from the rag where I thought, Ugh. <laughs> Didn't do well there, you know. Like, <laughs> meanwhile, later on, I became a shit hot tanker because I was so bad at landing on the boat, I hit the tanker all the time. <laughs> Trade off. Hey, Marcus. Nature's way of compensating, you know. You got to be yeah. good at one. <laughs> I can always get a basket. So, Megan, question for you. So, in a typical week, as you were doing this in the rag and in the fleet, how often did you see a camera? How often would Peyton show up? And she would just be there for bursts. It would be like, oh, Peyton's going to be in this week. And we would have some interviews. Maybe there'd be stuff in the jet. Not always. A lot of times it would just be she's interviewing and talking to me before and after flights. So I met her in WCS. Which is a phase. Yeah. Weapons control system is a phase in the rag training. Basic intercepts. Paco, tell me if I'm wrong. I don't think she came to my fighter debt. No. I don't think you guys were there because I had some epic flights that would have been hysterical to interview on. <laughs> and then I saw her definitely CQ. She was out of CQ and we had cameras for CQ. Mm -hmm. And then it was when I was in workups. And I would say in workups, not four or five times. Again, it was burst, which made sense, right? It was just yeah. fairly low key. And the squadron got used to seeing her and they'd be like, oh, she's been taking bargains. You know? <laughs> <laughs> Except yeah, yeah. French, French didn't say that. Just my nugget friends. So now there were cockpit scenes. Yeah. Uh, I have no idea how the cameras were set up. It's so funny because now people's GoPros are probably way better. But it was literally just yeah. like a little camera right up here by the canopy on the side. You wouldn't notice it. Like at first you'd be like, what's that thing? And then you'd be like, oh, it's the camera. And then it just was not in your yeah. field of view. It wasn't in your scan. This was long before GoPros. Yeah, but there were small. I mean, I've watched cops for many years and they have lipstick cams that they put yeah. in undercover cars yeah and they say oh it's a tweeter you know part of the stereo system but it's really a camera sorry cops yeah. if i'm giving away <laughs> yeah. so there were some small cameras but crunch i'm glad you asked that because i watched that today and i'm going where did they get those yeah they had to be some of the earlier go ahead paco you get the real gouge <laughs> yeah we had this guy who we were so lucky to get his name is eric hildebrandt and he now works at pax river you guys probably know him. He made a bunch of really amazing photography books, naval aviation photography books. Gorgeous. Which Bio and I both have on our bookshelf. Oh, there it is right there. 
That's Eric Hildebrandt, and he was our camera guy. He, along with a guy named John Barons, but Eric did a bunch of the boat debts, and he would work in the plane a lot. He came up with some unbelievable solutions. And like you guys already mentioned, we missed HD by a couple of years. So we all of our little cameras with the lipstick cams, like they're standard def, which sucks. I mean, like if somehow technology had been a little accelerated, we would have gotten incredible, incredible footage. But as it turns out, it was still quite good. Well, it was just so early and so expensive. The year the Tomcat was going away, HD was brand new, yeah. right? We weren't flying around with little tiny HD cameras. We had a mix of HD and SD, all the stuff inside the cockpit is SD. And when we were filming all the stuff like in Fallon at Fairview Peak, we're standing on top doing the filming of like all the dogfight sequences. Those are million dollar HD cameras. Actually, the lenses themselves were six feet long and they were million dollars each. And we had two of them and the insurance on that was insane. So yeah, we had this mix of HD and SD, which unfortunately we missed the internal HD just by probably 24 months. Eric Hildebrandt was just a master of putting the cameras in really specific and interesting places. And at night for the night stuff, he had an IR camera. So there was like this braid of little IR illuminators. He put that right where the HUD is. And then there was a camera somewhere. So, you know, Megan and Jay are getting bathed by this IR light and the camera's picking up their night trap faces. Oh, that's awesome. That explains it. Cause I, yeah, I mean, there's some great footage in there and I have to say, as you look at the footage in your movie that you guys made here, in reality, if you compare that to the original Top Gun movie, yeah. or you compare it to the final countdown, the flying scenes in this are so much better. Yeah. The footage is so much better. The in-cockpit footage is so much better. I mean, I know the rest of it's Hollywood and it's staged for a storyline, but it's so realistic and so good. I had forgotten how good it was until I was rewatching it going, they did a great job on that. If I had had another couple million bucks crunch, it could have been even better <laughs> <laughs> to do with what I had. Well, I just got to say, it's really good. So the folks who are listening and watching to this, some folks may not have seen or even heard of the movie, right? It was never in theaters. It was YouTube to Amazon, right? Am I right on that? It was never on YouTube. It was on Amazon and Prime. Prime. Oh, okay. All right. I'm sorry. iTunes. Wasn't it on a Delta? It was on Delta too, yeah, for a couple of years, actually. I feel like someone's like, I just watched your movie on my flight. <laughs> <laughs> so if you're flying Delta, you're saying that you can get that through the streaming in-flight service. I'm very excited. It was a while ago, not anymore. It was on for a couple of years. At American, you know, we're just strictly like the big theater stuff as far as I know. Yeah. But in any case, that's pretty cool. I tell you, like I said, the footage, it is so much better. It is so much more realistic, so much more accurate, so much more exciting to watch what you guys did than any of the stuff in the original Top which the original Top Gun is, that's the gold standard, right, yeah. of Tomcat movies. And yours is so much better. Some folks who listen and watch are old Tomcat pilots, Tomcat Rios, or maintainers and have seen this and know about it. And then there are some who have never flown it. And I think it's fair to say that your product is a much better representation of what it's like than anything else that's out there. That's my take. Awesome. Honestly, that was our working title was the real Top Gun. I mean, obviously we couldn't use that as a release title, but yeah, that was our goal. Like this is the real shit. Well, I think you succeeded. I think that's awesome. Okay. Well, since we're commending, when I first heard about Speed and Angels, I was going like, oh, it's an F-14 Rio. Why am I going to watch a movie about F-14s, you know, blah, blah, blah. And then this pilot that I knew recommended it to me and he goes, bio, he goes, it's really good. And so I watched it and I tell him Paco this earlier that I watched it. This was years ago, shortly after it came out. And I was impressed. I loved it. I was very impressed. I enjoyed it. You know, if you're in our audience, like Crunch just said, you got to watch this movie because you'll love the movie too. I agree. Not only is it real, is it a documentary, but it's well done. It's got beautiful scenes. I mean, I like the photos of the F5. And now that you're telling us that it started out as a F5 movie or a VFC 13 movie, now it's making sense. Yeah, I never heard that before yeah. today. So now it's like, oh, the pieces are falling into place. Yeah. Yep. There would have been a very easy ability to slip into cheesy on this movie, like to have it just not come across the right way. And I think it really comes down to the editing and Peyton and Paco and the work that they were doing that really depicted. And what I loved about it, and Peyton used to say this, but the story, like for all intents and purposes, isn't about fighter pilots. It's just about two people that really had a dream to do something. And they figured out against whatever odds how to do it. And that story translates to anything. 
And I think that's why it really resonates and why it's not cheesy and it's very genuine. And I think that's why people enjoy it. Cause I think a lot of people who come through the ranks, like all four of us have, have a similar story. They have a story of wanting something that was hard and figuring out how to do it and not like accepting no, that just speaks to a lot of people. Yes. It is a universal, a pair of universal stories. Yeah. Except not everyone's got the face with a gun, but I mean, aside from that part. <laughs> Thankfully, that's a unique storyline. I mean, it's like, okay, oh. yeah. All right. Yep. Never been shot in the face. You got me on that one. Yeah. All right. And you know what? You get it. You win. You win. Yeah. I'm good. Exactly. Not going to compete with that. Yep. Yeah. Jay, it's too bad he's not here because he's got multiple brushes with the Grim Reaper. He and has come out laughing. So, but that's the most extreme. <laughs> Yes, it is. Well, cool. Megan, what are you doing these days? You know, you're pretty busy. I am busy. Yeah. I've been working for Amazon for coming on four years. I'm a senior manager. I work with Amazon Web Services. You know, I feel like as we all leave our active duty time and transition to something, and maybe everyone does this regardless of their military, but you're kind of like, what do I want to do when I grow up? <laughs> what am I good at? What do I like? What I realized, it's funny, after a few years within Amazon, I realized that I really like any work that's caring for the troops. Like I have been resonating and pulled to teams within Amazon that focus on caring for our internal teams, our internal customers and getting them what they need. Very nice. Um, so I've got a lot of different roles around that space and I really enjoy it. Awesome. That's great. And you're like out in what, Montana or something like Whitefish, that? Whitefish, right? Montana. It's the Northwest corner right next to Glacier National Park. It's the most spectacular place in the world. Every season is spectacular. I can agree. There's... Stuff you can do year round outside. Everyone here loves the outdoors and is super friendly. It's a small town, but everything's really close. There's an airport down the road. I mean, there's nothing you want that's not here, but don't move here. <laughs> <laughs> just visit. Just visit. <laughs> Megan was nice enough to host our family. We came out to visit them uh, a year ago. It was really fun. But did yeah. they make you sign something to say, we will not move here? Yeah, you can come visit us. We have room, but you wouldn't want to be here full time. It's too wonderful. <laughs> and are you still in the Navy Reserve or did you say you just... Yeah, no, I'm still in. I was going to retire, but I decided to stay in and I work for Third Fleet's Maritime Air Ops. So we basically simulate the air liaison element at a CAOC or an air operations center. So we support fleet exercises. It's awesome. I'm in a great unit, a bunch of aviators. So I get that nice get to go and kind of put the bag on and just, you know, have some beers and relive the glory days, do some exercises in Hawaii a couple times a year. Very cool. It's not a bum deal. It's a great way to stay connected to something that I really liked. That's awesome. How about you, Paco? What keeps you busy these days? Uh, well, I fly for Delta and I fly for TAC Air. So I'm back in the F5s. I wrote a book, a novel, a naval aviation novel, and I'm writing the sequel to that. Very good book. <laughs> Thank you. And the name of Paco's book is Lions of the Sky. It is an excellent book. And Paco, when I finished the book, I became a Super Hornet fan. Cool. It's a good book. And it's, we were talking earlier about taking notes and being sort of a, not a voyeur, but, you know, like a observer of what happened while we were in the Navy. And a lot of the stuff that happens in the novel is real. It actually happened. Some of it is inspired by Megan's story as well. It's just a fun, it's a thriller. It's a naval aviation thriller, but like Speed and Angels, there's a lot of granular detail and, and authenticity to it. So that's kind of like the way I like telling the story. And I'm writing the sequel right now. And I'm also working with a guy that Bio's worked with before doing a, a DCS video game. And Megan's going to be the voice of Slick, which was her call sign when I knew her as a young fighter pilot, Slick Varley. That's pretty cool, actually. That's a totally different experience for me working in... I'm not a gamer. I don't do video games. So The GCS campaign, yeah, but Reflected Simulations is great to work with. I give this guy tons of props because I don't know anything about video games. I don't play video games. I don't even have a PC. I have, I'm a Mac guy, so you can't play it on a Mac. And uh, he is incredibly patient working with my lack of knowledge and my schedule and my busy schedule in life. It's actually really fun. Writing a script for a video game is like writing a novel. I mean, I'm already on page 120 or something like that. So, and we're almost done. <laughs> yeah. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> You're doing a lot more than I did, but mine was different. So Yeah. It's actually, it's really cool. It's a mashup of Speed and Angels, the documentary, and Lines of the Sky, the book. So it's a rag class that goes to war with China, and there's a lot of stuff going on, and Megan's going to play herself. Do I save the day in the video game? That's all I care about, as long as I look really cool in the video game. <laughs> yes, you save the day. Megan goes through the rag, and then Megan goes through uh, and kicks China's butt. I can't wait to see it. My yeah. campaign was the Top Gun training debt to uh, Nellis Air Force Base in the 1980s. That's also very cool. Yeah. That was my comfort zone. Yeah. <laughs> Crunch, yeah. One last question that we always ask everybody. 
So I'll ask Paco first. Is there anything we didn't ask you that you wanted to tell us? You don't have to have something, but this gives uh, Megan the chance to think about something. So Paco, anything that uh, we didn't ask you that uh, you wanted to say? I would like to say, though, and we already mentioned it, them a little bit, but Peyton and Jay are such integral parts to the documentary Speed Angels. It's basically impossible to sing her praises enough in the making of this film. The way she ingratiated herself to the whole community and made herself a trusted source, she, as the director, made Speed Angels what it was. And then Jay, I mean, if you watch the movie, Jay is just obviously a hilarious and exciting part of the movie as well. So let me add a little bit of perspective on that. I've never met Peyton, yeah. but Crunch and all of us can say, you said she ingratiated herself. Yeah. And that people should realize that the Tomcat community or, or any community, if a person comes in and they're not genuine and sincere and they try to ingratiate themselves, they'll yeah. be rejected even more enthusiastically. Yeah. So clearly Peyton expressed herself, you know, candidly, honestly, to the benefit of the community and yeah. she earned everyone's trust. She did a phenomenal job of telling the story of of our community. Can't give her enough credit. Excellent. I feel like all of us can sit here and talk, see stories, and there I was, and this happened on dead or in port for hours and hours. None that I need to share, but over a cold (laughs) beer are fun to talk about. I think Paco hit the nail on the head. Such a big part of the story was Peyton and Jay. Peyton just, just did such a spectacular job. I know what it was like from my end trying to like, be assimilated and part of this group of predominantly men sort of in like the locker room experience. But I feel like I was sort of ready for it. I'd crawl, walk, run into it. She just came in, boom, like, what is this weird place? (laughs) Just figured it out because she's very genuine and easygoing, but also had a very clear vision and knew how to explain that to people in a way that they could understand and they felt comfortable with. And there's just no way it would have happened without her. We had a female pilot in VF211 when I was a skipper, and that was uh, Chrissy Cullen. Yeah. I thought she blended into the ready room perfectly. Mm -hmm. Good on you for uh, being accepted and feeling comfortable. Because once again, if a bunch of people who are like a homogeneous group and they get someone different comes in and they don't like that person, they won't make them feel comfortable. Yeah. And I mean, fully transparent. I did a lot of stuff wrong trying to fit in. Like I be like, I'll tell the dirty jokes or I'll laugh at all these things. I don't want to be the sensitive woman, you know, and I want them to think like I'm one of the guys, you know? And I look back on some of the stuff I did and I sort of shake and laugh my head at that wasn't the way and that wasn't going to be successful. And that evolved. And honestly, in a lot of ways, when I was doing that, as much as I don't think it was the right path, I did assimilate better. And then as I got more senior, and this is after Crunch left, It was really interesting, like meeting my husband, I would come home and be like, this happened at work today. And he would just be like, what? Yeah, That's not normal. That's not okay. And I'm like, oh, maybe that's not okay. Like, (laughs) And then I tried to sort of still assimilate, but sort of assert or say, but I didn't know how to do it right. That's a long conversation. But I will say in some situations, I assimilated very well. In some situations, I didn't tactfully try to stand up for myself and I made it harder for myself. And I realize that now as a 40 plus year old woman, I could hindsight being 2020. And some of the things I'm like, no, I really feel good that I took a stand there. It made it harder for me, but that was the right stand to take. Back in those days, and I would love to just have a drink with Crunch at some point 20 years later and just get his perspective on some of this stuff. But like there was assimilating and playing the game the way they wanted you to play it. Or there was really asserting what's like the stuff that was happening 20 years ago would not fly today. Some of it still would, unfortunately, but a lot of it wouldn't. But a lot of that's because you and people like you, like I had Carol Helker in, in 213 when I was there and, you know, she blazed the trail much like you did, Megan. And people like yeah. you and Kara changed the world for the people that came after you. I just feel like it's important for me to say very genuinely, yeah. I didn't assimilate perfectly. I look back and I'm like, oh, that was not a good way to do that. And I think everyone does that. But it was a hard minefield to walk through and figure out. And I look back at that woman who did it and I couldn't do it now. (laughs) Hats off to 24-year-old Megan because there were some intense situations. And some of them I brought on and some of them I was just, I don't want to say victim. I wasn't a victim, but I was, it wasn't something that I brought on. And I just had to sort of figure out the path through. Very interesting. It's tough being the icebreaker. I think we need to have a beer and have a conversation. My last year in the squadron, it was probably the hardest year of my life. I mean, just the abuse and the systemic, like, I mean, there was true trauma that took place in that year. And some of it was because I didn't tactfully assert myself. And some of it was because it was just a really fucked up situation. Like, I don't want to be someone to hear that and be like, she didn't just like 
there were challenging situations that I had to work through and were definitely part of the reason I did not stay in active duty. I'm not surprised, but I'm sorry to hear it. Yeah. I just want to be very authentic with that. I don't want to come off one way when I know that's not the real. But you guys were diving into something deep. And here's the other thing. What you said before, that 24-year-old Megan and all that, that was great. Because that was like, okay, let's people know that there's challenges and stuff like that. But then when we drill down, I'm going like, eh, that's a little bit more than... No, I hear you. Okay. So Crunch, you look like you're uh, thinking or... I'm like, okay. Yeah. When did you leave the squadron? Right after deployment or on deployment? We got back. We sunsetted the Tomcat. And right then. Everybody else went to the rag and did the Cat 4. And this jackass got to sit around and be the admin officer as punishment. So I was a Mo for deployment. And then Slave Boy goes, hey, I got two things. A good deal and a bad deal. A good deal is you don't have to be Mo. I'm like, how is that a good deal? He goes, and the bad deal is you get to be admin. I'm like, you give me two pieces of bad news. So I got to be the admin while the rest of you jerk knuckles got to go off and fly super hornets i got a cat four got 12 hours the rest of you all got like 50 yeah and then i left you loved being the mo didn't you loved it absolutely loved it megan and paco this was really even more interesting than i expected i mean i love doing these interviews but this was a lot more interesting not only talking about the movie but talking about your experiences and tomcat so thanks for uh, taking the time to come over and talk to us my pleasure thanks for having us it's fun And like I said before, I really mean it when I say that I think that your movie that you guys put together has the best footage, the most realistic flying footage of anything out there. And for any of our listeners who have not seen it, they really need to go. Paco, where can somebody go to watch the movie? Amazon or iTunes. Amazon or iTunes. And it's not even very much. I think it's only like five bucks, right? Uh, I don't think it's even that. I think it's three ninety nine to four, four bucks. Yeah. All right. It's only four bucks. I think it's about an hour and a half in length. It is absolutely, if you're a fan of the F-14, you have got to go see this movie. hundred percent. Watch it through the outtakes. <laughs> through the outtakes. Oh, okay. Yes. Good tip. I'll have to go rewatch. I don't know that I've watched through the outtakes myself. I'll do that. But Hey, thank you to both of you. Thank you for joining us today. Thanks for taking some time off. I know that you're both very busy and may have even taken time away from family to be here. And we and all of our listeners, thank you very much. And to everybody who's tuning in from Bio and Crunch and Paco and and Vargas Megan, hey, we'll see you later. All right. Welcome back. And thanks once again to Crunch and Bio for allowing us to repurpose your episode on Speed and Angels. Big thanks as well to Paco and Vargas for their time on that show. And I did reach out, by the way, to Paco. I'm like, hey, bud, going to uh, replay this over on FPP. Any worries? No, no worries. And while I had him, I said, hey, you guys didn't really talk about how did it do? In other words, what was the outcome? Did people like it? Did it make money? All these things. He wrote me back, and I'll just paraphrase what he says here. He says, we won a bunch of film festival awards for best documentary and audience favorite. He said, financially, I can't really answer because for about 10 years, it was out of my control. I own it again, but it's not bringing in a ton of cash 13 years later. And when I pressed him on that, he said that the financial supporter, I think he called him an angel that he had, ended up passing away right at the end when it was ready and his estate took it over. And because of the folks that were executing the estate, Paco ended up getting kind of muscled out a little bit. So he didn't get any data. He didn't really get to see how it did. But one thing he did say, and now again, I'm paraphrasing Paco, he says, it's always been very well received in the community. It's heartwarming and validating to hear naval aviators tell me how much they like it. Over the past decade, I've run into a bunch of kids, and by kids, I assume he means young aviators, who watch the movie many times while going through flight school as inspiration and motivation, and that's always cool to hear. I think it's a great calling card for Paco as he's writing books now and looking to otherwise further his brand as a creator. And so, yeah, we'll see what else he has in store. And again, I hope you appreciated this as the wrap up for Top Gun Month, the documentary, not movie. And if you already heard it over on the F-14 Tomcast, well, no worries. And if you're new to the Fighter Pilot Podcast, again, go check it out. They have 21 episodes now. They're only going to episode 26 before we wrap it up. The plan all along was just to do that one year. Every other Tuesday and we're just about done. And again, if you have it in your budget and in your heart to help out the F-14 Tomcast, they're their own business unit. You could go over to the fighterpilotpodcast.com shop page, look for the support us, keep us in the air, something like that. If you do make a donation, let us all know that it's for the F-14 Tomcast, please.
All right. Well, that will do it for this week and for Top Gun Month. I hope you enjoyed it. Now, we do want to announce our new Patreon supporters, and there's a bunch of them because we haven't talked about them in a while. We've got Strike Leads, Chris Hindi, Jacob Mark, Ski, and Ziggy. We have Mission Commanders, Aaron Bayless, and Mallory Bickers. And we have two new Air Bosses, Michael Braun and Jake Clark. And the Air Bosses are the highest possible tier. They get the most benefits. And I'm so thrilled that we have 28 folks that do that, really help keep this show going. And I don't know if you listen to a lot of other podcasts. You know, once in a while, we have advertisements, not all the time. Part of the reason for that is that we have almost 500 people, including, like I said, about 28 Air Bosses and a bunch of mission commanders and everybody else. You're all important. They do help keep us in the air. So big shout out to the Air Bosses, the Mission Commanders, and all our Patreon supporters. Now, do I need to tell you the views expressed in this presentation are the personal views of myself and the guests and do not necessarily represent the position of the Department of Defense or its components? Probably not, but I guess I just did. Oh, well. Hey, that will do it for Top Gun Month. We're taking a break next week. We've got the major U.S. holiday, but I won't leave you hanging. We've got an intermission episode in the spirit of that holiday, actually. But for you longtime listeners, kind of violate something we talked about way back on episode zero. Now, you'll understand what we're talking about on July 5th. Until then, be well, take care. Thanks for listening to the Fighter Pilot Podcast. And thanks for all your support during Top Gun Month, May and June. It was awesome. We'll see you. You've been listening to the Fighter Pilot Podcast, brought to you by BBR Productions. Got a question for the show? Email us at questions at fighterpilotpodcast.com or leave a message on our listener line at 877-MACH-101. That's 877-622-4101. Be sure to follow us on your favorite social media platform and check out our website, fighterpilotpodcast.com. For exclusive content and to help support the show, check out our Patreon page. Thanks for listening. Thanks for listening.